Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the news behind the news with Ralph Kentav on Mix 94.7 FM. And today we're going to have quite an interesting uh, topic. Uh, I have a guest here with me who is a tax expert. And, you know, they say that there's there are certain um, constants in life. That is death. Um, I forget what the other one is, but the last one is definitely taxes. You know, taxes is something you can't run from. People try it. And it's not legal, by the way, but uh, I think it was more than necessary to to have this discussion because, you know, um, certain things are kind of taboo. And I think that people get anxiety talking about anything that has to do with the legal system, justice system, taxes, land, you know, all these sorts of stuff. And uh, there's a lot of info. There's, there, there are proposals on the table um, where this field is concerned. And so I think it's only right to, at least uh, on this program, begin the discussion uh, with, with various uh, experts or persons in that field in the community. And to start it off, I have here with me Mr. Quincy Lunt. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to the program. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Ralph. Thank you, and um, good afternoon to everybody. Great. So before we begin, uh, Quincy, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm, I was born and raised in Curacao. I um, went through Fabio there in Curacao, and then went to Rotterdam to do my tax law um, studies. It starts with just the law, general Dutch law system, and then it specializes in the tax law. And after that, I lived there for approximately eight years in Holland. And um, I came back in 2008 to Curacao. And I joined their big four, big four um, accountancy firm that had a specific tax department to assist with clients and, um, you know, assist during audits and during tax audits. Um, that was indeed uh, my return back to uh, the Dutch Caribbean. Um, working there um, uh, at around in 2012 and 13, um, they asked me if I would want to live in St. Martin and man the office in St. Martin when it regards um, to tax advisory. Right, and um, so I accepted the challenge. I was already five years working with the company at that stage and uh, became a manager so I could do my own portfolio. And um, it, was a, it was a challenge um, being in another country and also um, you know, dealing with other type of tax questions. Um, other tax questions that we get there in, in Curacao are slightly different than what we get here mm -hmm. but um it, it it's nice it's nice and uh, uh i learned a lot from it gotcha yeah yes. and i'm mm -hmm. sure you fell in love with some in the process <laughs> yes yes indeed indeed yeah. that's why i stay mm -hmm. okay great so um of course like i mentioned earlier you know there's there's been discussions of um revamping our tax our tax system and then there are proposals that were made by the world bank yeah. of course it's something that that is in our country package, mm -hmm. um, and uh, CFT, uh, uh, as per usual, have also, you know, made commentary where this is concerned. Mm -hmm. um, I do get that. Well, for the time being, we won't necessarily touch on that as until we get you know, more information that we can really go through and discuss. Yeah. Um, but still, you know, uh, like I said, taxes is something that can be that seems and, and it kind of is um, mm -hmm. complex. Yes. And mm -hmm. even for my person here, I mean, I have like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tons of questions here for you, so mm -hmm. let's see what we get through. But to start off, uh, I guess I would uh, first start by asking you a question that may be a little broad, but mm -hmm. you know, how does our tax system work? Well, yeah, it's indeed a broad question, um, but let me try to give you an answer. It is indeed designed where the uh, broadest shoulders will carry the, more, the, the, the bigger burden. So it, that's why it has some progressive tax rates. The, the table which, it, which you see the taxes will start at around 12, 12 and a half and go up to 47.5. That already shows you the philosophy of, okay, the, the more you earn, the, the, the more, more you, you would pay. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I can say about our system. Our system has um, income tax, so direct income tax, but also has indirect taxation, that indirect tax would be um, anything on the consumption level. Now, in St. Martin, we have the turnover tax, which is 
um, equivalent. It looks a lot like a sales tax of not necessarily a VAT, but all in the family of indirect taxes. But the fact that it's being charged to the entrepreneur, to the business, it hits them directly. So it's an indirect tax in its sort, but a lot of people, uh, the entrepreneurs, they um, experience it as a direct tax that hits them directly yeah. instead of a tax that would be related to the transaction, that would be added up on the transaction. And then you could see, let's say you paid 2 3% of tax mm -hmm. on a certain transaction. Mm -hmm it hits the business less than in the situation where you don't see the tax yeah. at all. And then, but at the end of every month, they gotta, need to compute yeah. the 5% and still pay it. Yeah, and wouldn't, wouldn't, I guess, even with that, wouldn't you collect more money that way? I'm not sure. It is. It is. Because it fluctu fluctuates, right? Yes, yeah. it is, it's, there's discussions about, um, let's say, um, having the value added tax that's also something that you would see on the invoice but a challenge with value added tax is that you have to record the credit so everybody every next chain in that um, supply chain um, will have will be entitled to some refund or a credit so you need a robust system to look to to monitor that and make sure that um, you know, everybody gets their their credit recorded properly. They get it applied to their to their own tax bill. So it is. It, it can be very be, complicated. Yeah, yeah, even more complex. Then. Yes. Yeah. I think it would be more complex. One, would, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. It would, yeah. I guess it would require more investment as far as uh, the digitization of you know, exactly. our tax office and whatnot, yeah. and of yeah. course more personnel. Yes, I think so too. It depends, um, you know, you have specialists in, in this field too. Um, and I am not a specialist on the field of tax legislation and making, draw, drafting tax. Um, um, but we, you know, we remember what was taught to us during, you know, during the studies. And there are different models. You need to look at your economy, how small it is, uh, what's your focus. Do you want to attract a lot of foreign investors? Then you need to apply certain taxes if you don't want. So it's, uh, you know, IBFD, you have the International Bureau of Fisc for Fiscal Documentation. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of um, professionals related to them that would be able to do that. Uh, I know that uh, IMF also has a fiscal affairs department that yeah. is very, very active on that field too. So um, I would just, you know, um, study whatever they come with and trust the system instead of now starting to tell them what it should be without me having that background. You gotcha. know, so yeah. I want to stay out of that type of... Uh, gotcha, I follow you. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I follow you. So um, even when I was concerned, because, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, the TOT, which uh, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. we know it was something that was supposed to be temporary. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's still here. Mm -hmm. um, but indeed, it, it is a can be quite a blow to businesses because yeah. um, you also have to consider if, if you have staff, you got to pay mm -hmm. for their SLV. Mm -hmm. um, and then, too, at the year end, if you make a profit, there's also a profit tax. So, yes, so you know, so usually, you know, there's this discussion as whether our taxes are too high or, mm -hmm. um, yeah, if our taxes are too high or also um, if we tax too much. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess, how would you assess such a situation? If someone claims that they're being taxed too much, or that's the question? Yeah. yeah. Well, um, what we can do in our situation, what we look at is um, when you come, you set up your business, you have your business plan, and we look at all the different taxes and what, what impact it would have with your current plans. And then during such a conversation, we will try to guide the client into... Um, um, optimizing their situation when it regards the taxes to avoid that you incur unnecessary taxes, right? So the taxes are there. You're not avoiding the taxes, but anything that's unnecessary, you will um, you will advise the client to don't follow that route. It has to do with interpretation of certain things. Let's say, for example, you have a company car. 
um, you would see people that say, well, they would want to drive a certain car. They were going to withdraw those funds from the company and buy it on their own name. That, from a tax perspective, is not efficient, and it's, it, it leads to the tax, the, with the funds that have been withdrawn will be considered um, f- income for that individual. If the in- individual is only an employee, it goes through the payroll taxes. If it is also the director, shareholder, you should usually smaller companies, you have just, you know, the director and shareholder at the same time, it can be considered dividends. So those things from, a, let's say, a business rationale, you no, know, I think it's my money. I generated all this income with the company, so I'm free to do whatever I want with. But then you would see if they speak to a tax professional, um, they would rec- be, they would be recommended to buy that vehicle immediately with the funds of the company, and not to withdraw the money first to their personal account, and have them go and gotcha. buy it. Gotcha. Right. So that is a, let's say a straightforward example of um, of benefit of talking to a tax advisor before you engage in certain transactions. Mm-hmm. Also, you would say before you engage in a transaction is the best, but also before year end, we can still help you and say, well, this this shouldn't be done this way. Um, and then you could still adjust slightly. Once the year is over and the books are closed, it's just a fait accompli. And then um, you will be you will have an issue when the tax auditors come. Right. Or an issue. It would be. It would lead to all this accumulation of tax that you could have avoided. Avoided, yeah. Right? Gotcha. And um, the thing with the tax audits is they come for a few years um, in hindsight. So then you see it's two, three years together. If you have one mistake in there, that same mistake is happening for the two, three years, and you will have penalties and fines added to it. Right? So it is um, something to really pay close attention to to your Mm -hmm. bookkeeping before and the tax consequences of certain um, transactions or certain yeah bookings that you would have from an accounting perspective you would Mm -hmm. have them and it looks okay but then from a tax perspective knowing our system then you would say well you shouldn't have done it this way because now it's leads gotcha. to accumulation gotcha yeah because the next thing that comes to mind is um and while i understand what you, you said mm-hmm. earlier not necessarily going into the um, road of legislation and stuff mm-hmm. um is because you often still hear you know well is it a matter of enforcing the system we have or does mm-hmm. it really need an overhaul of changing mm-hmm. but before you comment on that i guess mm-hmm. what you just shared you know, the first thing that came to mind is the myths that people have yes. where taxes are concerned. I yes, guess, could you, could, could you do some myth busting? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me think about a myth right now. Um, well, there is one, I could say, the, 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 the capital gain on transactions incurred by personal, um, on your personal taxes, or so by individuals selling, let's say, cars, mm. or selling um, uh selling uh, their house there is an idea that you could sell the house that serves as primary residency you can sell it and the capital gain that you realize will not be subject to tax now that is accurate but that doesn't mean that you can start building houses on a as a business on a regular building and selling gotcha living in it for a few months and selling etc or having heavy equipment on your personal name it's not used in a business but from time to time you buy some and sell some that speculation that already buying and selling that could lead to it being a business so before you assume a red flag basically yeah before you assume that no i have a carte blanche i can buy and sell on my personal title because capital gains are not subject to tax. Mm. Before you do that, you need to make sure that the activity that you're engaging with in that, let's say, hustling type of thing um, can also be considered a business. And don't forget, the tax authorities come a few years later. 
when you and they look at the whole page they don't look at this transaction that you they the in, bulk the bulk mm -hmm. they look at the whole activity and say well to me this was just more than let's say amateuristic speculation because that is not subject to tax so when you go and deal with the um, let's say the cryptocurrencies and it's not in a professional way you, you could argue that any gains that you make on those transactions are not subject to tax right gotcha. so, but once it's now it's a business that's your they it's you active up, yes yeah. active every morning like a day you wake trader up or exactly mm -hmm. then you can't claim that is just amateuristic yeah, yeah. Um, um, speculation no more. Because, as they say, the numbers speak. Yes, indeed. <laughs> numbers indeed. speak, they say a lot. Um, so, as you may even mention cryptocurrency, mm -hmm. um, do you pay taxes on money you, so income you earn abroad? Let's say, yes. let's say for example, I sell something on eBay. Yes. Um, I, I make some money doing that. Uh, do I pay income here? I mean, do I pay taxes here in St. Martin for yes. that? Yes. That's also a myth. People think about, okay, I live in St. Martin, but I did my uh, whatever transaction I engaged in outside of St. Martin stays out of scope for the tax authorities in St. Martin. Well, that is incorrect. It starts with our system. If you're a tax resident of St. Martin, you're subject to tax for your worldwide income. Yeah. Right, so then you could trace all transactions if you have anything going on outside of St. Martin. You should record it and um, declare it in your income tax return. So it's your personal responsibility to yes um, declare whatever income additionally you make abroad. Correct. Gotcha. Correct. Gotcha. So that's the second myth we got there. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we might find some more mm -hmm. uh, throughout the conversation, which is good, you know, so that, yeah. you know, we can, um, yeah, people can shape up themselves in, yeah. in different ways. Because, and that's why you structure, once you start doing things internationally, you need to talk to a tax professional, tax lawyer, tax advisor, um, to structure it properly. Because probably if you have those type of income, you would want to have a company, a legal entity, and with a company now, there's other rules as in if that item or that source of income is already subject to tax elsewhere, you could look at it better. There are better, you know, it's, it makes it clear if it was already subject to tax elsewhere, it's, it's um, easier to prove. We have a situation in, in St. Martin, people work living on the Dutch side and working on the French side. Gotcha. Right? That is also a situation where because you live on the Dutch side now, you're subject to tax on your worldwide income. Right? Mm -hmm. So that tax and in, that income that you get from your work on the French side is now subject to personal income tax on the Dutch side. Wow. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. what, uh, what also happens is then people would receive, let's say, their payslip and they see that there are some deductions from the French authorities. A lot of those deductions, the bigger portion of it, usually is not the income tax, but it is the other social insurance premiums yep. that they have there. All those, um, it, it hits you because it's deducted from your income, but you don't get avoidance of uh, double taxation on social insurance premium. You get it on income tax portion that you paid. Right, so that is also, um, yeah, a situation that we need to find a better solution for. I think the authorities, French side and Dutch side, More need to come linked. with a, yeah, with a streamlined um, double tax treaty. Usually, a double tax treaty is an is a treaty between two countries to avoid double taxation of their tax residents. So then it mm. would have agreements on okay, if you reside here, um, you will receive a relief. It's my my tax residents will receive a relief when they work in your in on your territory or they generate income on your territory. So those type of agreements, there are model standard agreements developed by the OECD. Mm -hmm. um, we have something similar in the in the kingdom between the Dutch Caribbean islands. We have it also with the Netherlands. St. Martin and Netherlands have a, a because we are. It's not. It's it's a, it's false. It follows the same points in the agreement. Yeah, mm -hmm. in the agreement arrangement agreement, but it is not a treaty because 
we are within yeah, yeah, the same within, kingdom. Yeah, so it's like right? yeah, but, redundant basically. Yeah, yeah, but I, I mean, I love that you said that. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't even think about that. Mm -hmm. You know, I really love you said because yeah, we we are one island, yeah. and clearly there are hundreds and maybe thousands of people who. You know, live on one side, work on the other side. Yeah. Um, so you see, even as the conversation national unity is concerned, this is a, another thing to add on top of it. Correct. Besides, maybe a broader protection and whatnot, mm -hmm. like yeah. tax, a tax treaty. Indeed. Oh, uh, yeah. So um, one of the things you mentioned too, uh, even as, as as far as our businesses are concerned, mm -hmm. um, and my question to you is, uh, what should businesses consider? You know, where mm -hmm. taxes are concerned. You know, before starting or investing, whether it's uh, people here locally even for mm -hmm. investors mm -hmm. what they should consider before they make their investment in mm -hmm. assets or before they start before um uh, making an investment so let's say in assets but mm -hmm. also in starting a business okay um i would say it's good for the businesses to understand their business model let's say for tot i always say about business model for tot you pay on your revenue so that remuneration that you receive, that's your turnover. Um, because people tend to simplify things, they want to say, well, TOT is paid over all what hits your bank account. Now, the risk of following that rule of thumb is if you work based on commissions, you will receive more funds on your bank accounts than are, that are not intended for you. You will have to pay it through to the to the to the third party to the or um, indeed in how yeah in any event it will be income that is not yours mm -hmm. or and that's why it's not income but it hit your bank account those things gotcha. yeah so you need to understand I will be paying only over my commission I will be paying TOT also that only that commission is then your income on the side of income when you have to compute your profit tax, right? At the end of the year, it's your income minus all your expenses. There are investment allowances, there are deductions. You deduct all of that, and then you have your taxable base for profit tax purposes. That's what you can use then further. Um, you need to, so a business coming, someone um, with their, you know, someone approaching us with their idea to invest, you want to know, okay, you're going to invest in real estate for for what purpose? Will it be a hotel? Will it be Airbnb? Will it be long-term um, rent? Um, you want to actually know exactly what you how you, you how you envisage your business growing as well. Gotcha. At which moment you think you have to reinvest or invest in, let's say, equipment or a platform, a software that you need, whatever you would need for a business. The smaller it doesn't. That's why it doesn't really. It's not related to the size of the business, and more on the activities. What are you going to do? So. Also, people tend to ask us, yeah, but you, you guys are for the only for the big corporations. We, um, the big corporations tend to reinvest more often. Every time you reinvest, there is a tax benefit to collect there. So that's why they come to us to... to how, how so? There, you have an investment allowance, mm -hmm. which is 8% of the amount invested. So let's say you invest in equipment again. You invest um, in yeah equipment that costs a few thousand. It has to be more than five thousand guilders, but let's say ten thousand. You get an eight percent additional deduction mm. as your that as a tax incentive. You get it the first year and the year after you made the investment. Another advantage of investing um, surplus cash turn around and buy a business asset with it is that you can also depreciate quicker you could depreciate accelerate the depreciation usually you have let's say the the lifespan the economic lifespan of an of an asset would be five to ten years you apply there's a, a fixed interest percentage you apply uh, your depreciation but for tax purposes, that, that's what I just said, is for accounting purposes, right? For um, tax calculation purposes, now you are allowed 
to apply up to one third of that initial investment, you allow to depreciate it in one year. Hmm. Usually that would lead to um, losses, taxable losses that are now available for carry forward for the next 10 years. So you will show losses in your tax computation, but your company is still doing good Mm -hmm, and making mm -hmm. profits, Mm -hmm. right? And that is also something that, let's say, go back to myths. I think this is the fourth one. (laughs) Yeah. uh, So to myths, it it has to do with people tend to think that you have um, your financial statements for tax purposes. Mm -hmm. It's something that you could do, let's say, all type of tricks in it. And then you have your your audited financials, two separate. It's it uh, it has it's governed by a lot of rules, uh, rules called um, if you translate it to Dutch, um, translate from Dutch it's to English, English. It's sound business practice. Gotcha. So it's a whole combination of all type of rules um, that come from literature, but also they are uh, these rules are developed in case law as well, and um, it will those. Those rules, um, they would say, let's say you're not allowed to uh, follow a disposal of of um, business assets that you have there. Um, from an accounting perspective, you want to take as much as possible of the loss related to you discarding that, disposing of that asset. But then for tax purposes, there are rules into at which moment you can take a loss on a disposal. If you sold it, you can take a loss on a disposal. Mm. If you dispose of it on your own, then you can take a loss from a tax perspective. So those rules, they are unfortunately, they are not written in one simple book. It is um, something from the old Dutch gap and related to all those principles and, and that I just mentioned that came up in the case law. Gotcha. So it is something that when you actually do this tax law studies or the tax law, um, uh, tax economics also, um, um, you will be confronted with it in a, in the Dutch system and it's called goedkoopmansgebruik. That's what I just tra- translated into sound business practice. Gotcha. So again, your tax Let's say your tax professional, your tax accountant, whoever you're relying for needs to know these things. If they don't, if they are not familiar with this legislation or with this, these type of rules, you, they would think that certain deductions are allowed based on the accounting principles. You have the IFRS, mm-hmm. you have the IAS, International Accounting Standards. So you need to make sure that whoever you're relying on on for your tax calculation understands this Dutch legacy. Gotcha. Yeah, this is uh, pretty m- meticulous. Right? Mm, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It becomes very meticulous. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. yeah which well, I'm glad you you know you really gave a detailed response there because uh, even when the, the first thing you said about um, um, I, I like basically it doesn't necessarily just apply to the size of your business mm-hmm. because you can be a small business. Let's say our business um, mm-hmm. that I, me and my wife have mm-hmm. investing in uh, mixers, you yes. know, so we can better. Produce exactly. Charlie Cakes, let's say, you know, exactly. that, that is a reinvestment. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Thanks for the, the, yeah, the yeah. tip on that one. You're um, welcome. But we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the news behind the news on Mix 94.7 FM. You're listening to Ralph and Tav. And this afternoon, I am joined with Mr. Quincy Lunt. Uh, he's a tax expert that I brought on to talk about taxes. <laughs> um, and it was a conversation we had off air um, that I would definitely like for him to get into is uh, the matter of the tax audits. Yes. You know, uh, we do have the audit team, St. Martin, mm-hmm. um, which are currently busy doing their auditing and so forth. And you mentioned something in particular, uh, maybe mm-hmm. uh, controversial, mm-hmm. <laughs> but I know that you will back up what you state, mm-hmm. which is, you know, the benefit of audits as far as igniting business growth. Yeah. I found that pretty interesting. Could you, uh, yeah, give us some more detail yes. on what made you come to that conclusion? Yes, that's, uh, I think, my own thought about it. Um, it has to do with this. If our tax system, how it is right now, is based on your own tax declaration. So you have the taxpayer, based on the law, the taxpayer needs to declare on a monthly and pay also the taxes due on a monthly when it regards 
turnover tax and payroll taxes, right? For you to do that, you need to have a basic understanding of turnover tax to complete your tax return and also uh, the payroll tax. So you would need that knowledge or you would have to go to a bookkeeper administrator. If the bookkeeper and administrator also, the knowledge that they have is, let's say, limited or it's just a trick that they were taught and then they keep doing it the same way without actually understanding what they are doing, you could have that people have been doing a tax return in a certain way for years and years until they got a tax audit. And during the tax audit, it is explained, it becomes clear that they have been handling um, not in accordance with the law, sometimes um, to their disadvantage, and also, um, uh, yeah, that could lead to fines and other complications as well. But just let's keep it just as you, as a businessman, not doing what is in your in your in your interest, right? In your benefit when you're declaring your monthly taxes. Now, if we don't have those tax audits taking place, that's the moment that you really enforce the law. And you enforce the tax law and you explain it to the business community. And the more people get involved in a tax audit, the more they start understanding um, the actual, actual consequences of certain transactions. Like my example, we're drawing monies. Yeah. And then go in buying stuff and s still claiming that you bought it for, for the, the business, company, but, in your, uh, but it went personal. first to yeah. your name. And then so those type of things, it becomes evident during a tax audit because they have the figures. They ask you 15 times why in this and that, you know, it's, um, you know, the tax auditors, they come to find mistakes. They don't come to um, smooth things. Over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> smooth things over or try to help you out or they can they come to find mistakes. Gotcha. And the role, it's all roles are divided. The role to help, you know, and 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 um, who is going to work in your interest? That is the tax advisor. Right. So they will not. Um, automatically, even if, if you have a tax auditor with a great heart and, you know, they want to give you a tip, they might give you a tip. We have experienced that, too, when they see that, the, you know, the consequence of whatever this taxpayer was doing is so detrimental for whatever they, they are going to give you a slight tip. But it's not their role to come and it's give you tips. It's not to be ex expected, basically. Either. Exactly. It shouldn't gotcha. be expected. You know, what They come to find mistakes. And that is also a reason why you say from the moment you receive an invitation, that is when you want to talk to your representation, which is the tax advisor or your bookkeeper that you trust that has that knowledge. At least top st what, what I want to do is um, that people understand that they need to start talking to their financial expert around them. Look, look here, I received a letter from the tax auditors, they are coming this and this and this. And then that financial expert is the one who will say, well, um, I think it's best you talk to a tax advisor now. What are the benefits of having a tax advisor involved? There are questions that can be posed, um, but there are also sometimes questions that, that are slightly over the, let's say, over the limit, um, where they, the, the tax auditors you could say you could consider that they are overdoing it a bit but to find as much as information as possible to levy their tax assessments that they want to levy. Uh, when you have a tax advisor that knows the rules, you could keep them at bay because it's a corporation. You are um, obliged by the law to give your cooperation to the tax auditor and every um, uh, everyone else mandated by the tax inspector to, to, to request this information, also the ops, uh, ops voting, and everybody. So um, it is important to know the rules and to know how you can keep the tax uh, authorities at bay while they're doing their job and while you're also cooperating. Now, if you leave it, if you leave that open to a businessman, maybe they try they will try to um, save themselves by doing something that's completely against the law like maybe shredding documents or 
hiding documents. Mm -hmm. You need it, someone again that knows the rules and would say, yes, this works doesn't work in your uh, favor, mm -hmm. but you have to present it when it when the tax authorities ask for this document, right? And then no, because you have someone knowledgeable of the law, you're you will not be acting against the law. Yeah, you will just delay the moment or actually wait until they ask for that specific question yeah but then uh, even with that uh listen to you it's it's in, i guess it helps build that confidence as well yes because like i said at the beginning it's it is intimidating correct <laughs> um and you hear the let's say the cries of people you know when it comes to tax assessments and so forth yeah i'm so glad um mm -hmm. you detailed it in the way you did yeah yeah. So uh, one of the things as well, um, maybe this can be considered a myth that you can help clarify mm -hmm. uh, the tax exemptions. Yes. You know, yeah. um, basically, you know, I think simplification kind of helps, but um, oversimpli oversimplification can be dangerous. Yes. And you have to hear that. Well, you know, if you set up your business so and so, mm -hmm. uh, you could do this and that and, and get a tax write off. Yeah. <laughs> so what are what are those real exemptions that exist? Well, um, let's say you could see in turnover tax, you have like 21 different exemptions. Um, one that comes to mind immediately is the one that when you're renting a space for long term, um, for long term and also that is going to be used as the personal residence of this tenant, then um, that TOT that you generate on those rental uh, th those rental fees is not subject to tax, right? So yeah. that's an exemption for the the landlord now that has a business of renting um, renting um, personal space as residency. Gotcha. So no, it doesn't work for a commercial unit. Um, that would be then a tax exemption from a turnover tax perspective. There's so many of them. Um, but it doesn't lead to a write-off. The write-off is more what I mentioned before, which is, let's say, investing in certain assets, gotcha. business assets. If you invest, you get, if it is an investment in real estate, it's 12%. If it's a regular business asset, it's 8%. You could use it two years. And as I mentioned, also the accelerated depreciation. So I look again at a real estate, a building of 300,000. Now you can apply up to 100,000 in write-offs, deductions, mm. which leads to losses, right? And mm. those losses you can use now for 10 years. So um, it isn't, let's say, you have to go in this business because this business has more tax write-off or yeah. not. It is more like, um, yeah, just try to understand again yeah, yeah, your yeah, business yeah, model. Yeah, business, got you. And then see and, um, you know, uh, there are a lot of professionals on the island making business plans. Try to get a business plan in place that also shows the forecast for like three to five years. When you have that in place, then you know, okay, at this moment I will, I will have to reinvest. Or if at this moment I want to expand, I will have a next office on the other, let's say the other side of the hill, right? Something mm -hmm. to that extent, you, mm -hmm. need to, you need to, let's say, think forward and look also at the figures, also regularly try to monitor your, fig uh, your figures and see, um, um, let's say if you have draft figures in October, you know what you can do still for the last three months to try to mitigate any unnecessary tax exposure, gotcha. right? Because it's again, um, your fair share is what you will have to pay. And that fair share, you come to a tax advisor, tax professional that knows the law, it will make sure that you pay your fair share. Now, there are practices, as I mentioned, there are practices, people deducting, um, 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 yeah, t making certain tax deductions that are that appear logic to them or to come from another system, but they don't have a legal basis in our system. Mm -hmm. But if they have been doing that for years and years, they think that's the way to go about it. And only when you get a tax audit, it the law is, reinf is uh, actually enforced, and that moment they get to know that they w that it was wrong. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, to go back to that point where then it builds confidence, but also um, the business morale will, when it regards to taxation, goes to a next level, gotcha. right? And then you will get also more tax experts wanting to live here and, yeah. and, and um, yeah. 
Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad you said that because uh, that reminded me uh, that um, a side note discussion we had. Mm-hmm. Basically, when I asked you know about our our economy, yeah, um, as far as uh, its complexity or capacity to you know increase more, like do you because you know, do you find that St. Martin's at a level where you know we can really let's say we have what it takes to go to another level mm-hmm. as far as our financial industry is concerned, mm-hmm. and, and, and and having you know more professionals yeah. uh, see this as a viable place to to reside. Yes, I think indeed um, those audits will help. Uh, uh, there needs to be a moment, an awakening of people to take matters more professionally, more seriously at the next level. And once you stop do, start doing that, at that moment you will also have, you attract other professionals that want to provide advice or your questions, the text queries that they will get then only not only taxes but all type of transactions will get also a bit more complicated and where more but in a good sense yes mm-hmm. in a good sense mm-hmm. more complicated you you so you're lifting yourself up from um, doing things in a let's say amateuristic way mm-hmm. start doing it more professionally so that that works to the bookkeeper, the bookkeeper that's now going to make sure that all the bookings are, he stands 100% um, behind them and not just, we do it this way because who's going to know? The business The business owner doesn't understand what I'm doing and nobody's going to audit and it's going to be five, six years from now. We'll see. At that moment, we'll deal with it. No, if you have at that moment already people in the business community and the financial services providers that know that the chances of getting an audit are real and the problems will surface at that moment. If you have that, you will have, of course, also the, 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 the yeah, all the professionals involved yeah. taking matters more um, as serious as possible. Yeah. That's, um, you know, yeah, not, I follow you. Yeah, because yeah, um, that to me says, you know, there's more security and stability in, yes. in, in the island's business climate. Because yes. I was going to ask you, well, you know, how can businesses start cleaning up earlier? But I said, well, well, in mm-hmm. what you said, rather, mm-hmm. you know, what you outlined simply is really prevention is better than cure. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, before even launching and, and so forth is to, you know, um, do the home, do the, you know, do the back work, do the homework yes. um, to protect yourself. Yes. Because yeah. mm-hmm. the bottom line is you're not going into business to, to find ways to just um, get tax breaks or incentives, no. like no. you know, I guess that that more speaks to the motive of what what, what you're in business for, what you the Correct. service or good that you're trying to deliver. Correct. Yeah, and that's why that's why when I'm talk about the forecasts, we need to see what what do you intend to do with this business? How do you intend to grow? What's going to be your role in this in this market? Mm-hmm. And then once you have that determined already, now we're going to say well. A tax benefit could be X, Y, or Z, right? And then we're going to look at your existing plans and make a suggestion that can save taxes yep. and make sure that you only pay your fair share. Because indeed, something also in our legislation is that um, it's the taxpayer that needs to know how much, uh, what's their tax liability. It's more on especially with the tax returns that are on the on a monthly basis, which is the turnover tax and the payroll tax. If you don't know necessarily know the details of what you're doing there, you might be overpaying. Mm. Right? And then if you're overpaying, yeah, I mean the tax authorities are not gonna come out of their out of their self and 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 tell you that you overpaid. So the fair share in determining what's your fair share I think it's always good to talk to a tax professional. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. And even something else that came to mind as far as ex- exemptions mm-hmm. is uh, uh, seaport vessels. Yes. The idea with seaport vessels is that, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, the turnover tax is a uh, consumption type of tax. So now, if you can easily, if it's, it's, if it's clear that the consumption of whatever product that's been sold is not taking place within our territory, 
then you go, then you get that exemption. So that's why the sea going vessels will get that exemption, especially if you have the ones that have an itinerary that you know where they're, they're going to an export. They're not oh. just, they're not just um, doing, let's say, a little boat charter around the island. That's not, that doesn't qualify for that because basically whatever you sold to them, the, 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 the gasoline, the, the, the lubricants, um, the, the, even the food, food and beverage is being used in our waters. That's why it doesn't apply to a, a, a boat charter business that stays around. Now, if you would have a slightly bigger um, um, boat That's operation mm -hmm. that now goes actually goes to other ports outside, let's say they go to straight to Saba, straight to Seba Station or Gates. So even the French side? Yeah, mm -hmm. even the French side, I've seen it. I think um, it's an arguable position, but again, we didn't have the discussion with the tax authorities on it. But I feel that that could also be defended, that you say it isn't used in our waters, it isn't consumed, so that's why we apply this tax exemption that is in the TOT. So that, again, is, let's say someone comes with a vessel, mm -hmm. one of the questions is, are you going to have a, let's say, a itinerary that goes to the other islands. If yes, you might be able to qualify for this exemption, right? Gotcha. That's that's all you advise. But you don't tell the people um, you just bought a boat. Okay, if you buy a boat, you 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 will you will have to go to the other islands to claim an exemption. <laughs> yeah, gotcha. that's yeah. that's guiding them, um, ne not necessarily guiding them with realization of their dream as yeah. that boat ch boat charter business, but now you're guiding them to go and get the tax benefits if there are any to get, yeah. right? Yeah, gotcha, which is not a purpose of business. No, <laughs> that's not a purpose. Yeah, indeed. So um, another main thing with tax is concerned, you know, it's always uh, the discussion on compliance. Yes. Um, it is rumored, uh, I would say, uh, to be 30%. I don't mm -hmm. think that it's still exactly clear what it is. Mm -hmm. um, and so when that conversation comes up, you, you often tend to hear, well, Perhaps it's a matter of changing our tax system mm -hmm. or enforcement. Um, what w what would you say in your professional view is is the situation there? I think if you ask me, I'm going for enforcement. We need to find a way to identify all players, all little vendors, everybody that's fi forming part of the gray economy. Try to identify them give them a crypt number and make them also enforce on them that our legislation on them that they just follow suit. I think from that moment you will already see an increase in um, the tax revenues and of course it is time to to revamp to you know to modernize our tax system. I agree with that, but it's not necessarily that you have to change the tax legislation to yeah. get more uh, participants or m increase the compliance. I think there are other ways um, to go and identify all players on the island. It's not a, that big of an island. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so Very true. If you put the focus on that part, I think you identified everybody. Now that you identified everybody, more audits, more targeted audits on certain business industries where you think. Um, Things might, you know, you think, uh, let's say there are um, practices of, 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 uh, that, that are in, not necessarily in line with our tax legislation. You target those industries. And, um, yeah, I think that that would already create another type of environment that you can't really avoid the taxes no more because you're identified now. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so one of the things that also comes to mind, um, I guess, before we wrap up, mm -hmm. um, not sure if you can speak on this, mm -hmm. uh, but more so in terms of, you know, you tend to hear a lot of persons starting a business, mm -hmm. you know, wish that there was a, a break that they could get, especially, you mm -hmm. know, small business owners. Uh, so you often wonder if, if, if that's something that can be integrated into our system mm -hmm. um, where there's a couple months, you know, you, you don't pay TOT or something. Mm -hmm. But also, I guess, to, in addition to that, um, my question really is, you know, can we add uh, incentives or what incentives can we add to, I guess, encourage a more healthier, more robust mm -hmm. business climate on the, on the island? Um, I think, first of all, 
if you, I'm not sure that you need to have a tax break at the beginning to accomplish your economy, your business community being more robust. Okay. I think I want to say that first. Okay. Now, um, because I think once you get used to it from the beginning, you have to get used to it from the beginning so that so that you you know you always know that these funds are not for you but for the treasury right um that is one thing but you see that in the netherlands there are um considerably there there is a tax incentive for entrepreneurs for um for for businesses that are in this initial phases so that um we can look at that model already we don't really have to invent the wheel reinvent the wheel and um and that 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 i think if you ask me let's look at what uh, the netherlands have at, and look at if we can simplify that and apply it here don't forget there's a lot of more data available in the netherlands this tax administration system is um is working let's say more optimal than our tax administration system. So it will um, be easier for them to do those type of incentives because they can keep track. Now, if we are already having a hard time identifying our taxpayers, then trying to give them cuts, you can imagine that people are going to try to start a business every two, three years to still be considered a, a, a starting business. So. And that, that makes it hard again. If you look at the the, the goal setting for this new um, launch pocket and everything, it looks at simplifying certain things, but also um, um, avoiding the interference of of decision takers, right? And then the decision if you take if you make sure um, um, you include all type of. Uh, tax incentives that really require someone to monitor them it's going to be it's going to work um yeah average to what you're you, what so you're kind of to counterproductive do. counterproductive to gotcha. what you're trying to do because gotcha. now you're introducing new new um tax incentives with which which require much more um manpower gotcha. to, to monitor it okay so i think yeah, I don't see it happening anytime soon that there will be a specific incentive for starting businesses, um, starting. but it would be a good idea, so, or just only very hard to implement and actually monitor, avoid, misuse, abuse of it. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And is there anything else in particular you would like to end off with? No, not really. I mean, I want to reiterate that it's uh, a very good idea to make sure that your whoever you trust your financial trusted person um, that they at least know the tax lawyers on the island make sure you also engage with tax professionals before you uh, execute certain transactions while well, you're thinking about an investment try to see if especially if it's a quantifiable one then try to see um, if a tax benefit is available, and usually it's your tax expert, your tax professional, tax lawyer, that would be uh, the one who knows how that works. Okay. Um, there's one more question I came to my, <laughs> I actually got, because mm -hmm. um, you said um, something there that, yeah, just remember it. So basically, you know, um, being in, in, in taxes and stuff, um, uh, with it legally, mm -hmm. um, how what what are the cases like? Do you often go to court for for tax issues? Uh, can you maybe no. detail? No, we don't go to court as much in the field that I'm working in. That the office, the team that I belong to, okay. has a philosophy of trying to avoid the issues gotcha. and trying okay. to convince the tax authorities because before you reach to court, there are some moments that where and where you instances that you discuss with the tax authorities mm -hmm. and those moments is when you need to try to get as much as possible case law jurisprudence to support your uh, your, your perspective and convince the tax authorities that this is the way it should be done right in in benefit of your client um, another part of um, avoiding litigation is that it can be very lengthy 
and it's going to be expensive because based of the business model you deal on hourly rate um, so you try to avoid uncertainties gotcha. as much as possible whenever someone tries to apply um, any incentive we reach out to the tax authorities make a case why we think it applies it's applicable to this situation do you agree with us mr tax inspector mrs tax inspector if they agree there's no uncertainty left there's no issues with the tax auditors even all those documents you could keep on file even with uh, when you are subject to a tax audit um, you could show that to the tax auditor and that's what that substantiates the reason right um, so that's why we don't see it as much gotcha. went a few times but um, recently um, the last two three years I haven't been involved in any court cases. Okay, gotcha. Thank you so much, Quincy. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, yeah, you taught me a lot today, mm -hmm. and I'm pretty sure that our listeners and viewers did as well. So, guys, uh, thank you as well for tuning into the program, and do take care. Until next time.